Well, actually, it's, uh, it's a great honor to be with Randall. It's a great honor to be back in Charlottesville. Um, actually, I was in Charlottesville on Saturday and Sunday because my oldest son finished at the Darden School. So it's a, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for opportunities to come to, to Mr. Jefferson's University and to Charlottesville. I'm going to tell you a story about ANOVA. ANOVA, and I'm going to finish with the grand challenge and how I think ANOVA and the University of Virginia and other health systems in the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia can create something that's monumental and valuable for the world. So, um, I actually started working at ANOVA 30 years ago one of my first jobs, I worked at ANOVA for seven years, implemented an electronic medical record, built a large data warehouse, and then left and did other things, including work here at the University of Virginia. And uh, the CEO of ANOVA, who's been there for 35 years, called me uh, four years ago and asked me to come back and implement an EMR and build a data warehouse and try to do it right the second time. And I took the challenge and went back. And now what's exciting is we're going to have an opportunity, our two organizations and others in the Commonwealth, to work together. By the way, uh, Randall mentioned that I've always been interested in data. You probably should know. Uh, at age 17, uh, in Fortran, I created the first computer dating service in the Washington metropolitan area. And. Uh, sold that service to high schools in the metropolitan Washington area and was not matched to my sister, which was a great concern of mine when I actually ran the algorithm. I was afraid I'd get matched to her. I'm very fond of her, but I sure didn't want to be matched to her. Uh, and I've been interested in matching and in using computers to find um, valuable relationships ever since. And, and I think you'll see that in this story. So uh, quickly, Fairfax Hospital was created around 60 years ago as a small rural hospital in a very rural county in a rural state. Um, it's now morphed into a Nova Health System with five hospitals. Fairfax, the largest, with 1,000 beds. We have 1,900 beds uh, altogether, 15,500 employees, 500 physicians in the Inova Medical Group, 5,000 affiliated physicians. We have roughly $3 billion in net revenue, $200 million in net income, $4 billion in liquid assets, and 700 days in cash. That's a pretty healthy uh, institution financially. Uh, we've benefited from the extraordinary growth in Northern Virginia. And the reason we all have all that money is we're, we are penny pinchers to an extraordinary degree. It may not appear that way with the buildings that we're acquiring and building, but Inova prides itself in spending as little as it has to to get anything. And that culture um, is one of the reasons I think we probably have the cash that we have. But it also is affecting, it will, it will drive us to the, to the grand challenge that John talked about. Uh, it'll drive us to working with Randall and his team. It'll drive us to create a, uh, uh, a, an architecture for analytics that we can share in the Commonwealth. So, um, Inova is also becoming uh, an integrated health system. We have... Um, 500 physicians in the medical group. I mentioned it two, three years ago. We had no one in the Inova Medical Group. Um, our goal is 1,000 physicians in the Inova Medical Group by 2020. Uh, our goal is uh, a million covered lives in our health plans by 2020. Right now, we have roughly 250,000 lives in a joint venture with Aetna and with uh, a Medicaid HMO uh, in total health. Uh, we also have 2,000 physicians uh, contracting with us in what we call a signature partners. It's a, it's a uh, contracting vehicle for physicians to share payer contracts with us. 
and we're rolling that out across the Commonwealth at the same time we contract with UVA and other health systems to deliver care to populations over time. Uh, the analytics we need um, uh, to run this sort of an enterprise uh, are going to be at the heart of what we talk about and the reason that I'm here today. Uh, I'll mention technology services. That's the, the division of ANOVA that I lead. Uh, our focus is primarily on the digital transformation of medicine. All technologies are becoming digital. They're all interoperating. We've talked several times, John mentioned it, there, uh, the, the amount of data that we're producing from these, from these data sources. We intend to analyze those data, as Randall has pioneered in, in predictive monitoring, so that we can identify opportunities to care for patients better. My division has a budget of around $150 million a year operating and around $60 million in capital, excluding uh, radiology equipment. Uh, and we have around 500 employees in the technology division. It's made up of a program management office, telemedicine, analytics, IT and security, informatics and the EPIC team and clinical engineering. And all of these divisions work very closely together or we're supposed to work closely together. We're, we're working at it. Um, you might wonder, why is a PMO in there? Well, every project that we implement uh, has a project manager. Uh, and we actually are having very good success coming in on time and on budget. Recently, uh, uh, one of the other divisions of ANOVA uh, chose not to use the PMO. This was two years ago. And they recently shut down a project that was way behind schedule, way over budget. Um, and uh, uh, I think, if anything, um, convinced the leadership of ANOVA standardization of project management is more important than ever. Now the bottom two notes are important and I've alluded to it a moment ago. We're in the fifth percentile of organizations that use EPIC, large multi-hospital systems that use EPIC, meaning 95% um, of large hospital systems that use EPIC will have more people in technology than we have for controlling for revenue. Uh, we're in the 10th percentile for expenses because we have some consultants whom we need for rapid work, rapid development when we don't have the employees to do the work. So we're very lean and I say that because it will drive us to the grand challenge as you'll see in a minute. Um, in terms of IT and security, we have around 220 people. We're uh, some of the bigger projects. Cybersecurity is actually by, uh, is an enormous one. We're completely redesigning our network. We have roughly 70,000 devices on our network, um, in, including uh, equipment in radiology in the laboratory and, and uh, wireless uh, access points and the like. We are doing a major upgrade of our network to make it more secure and to give us more bandwidth. Since Netflix alone takes about 35% of our bandwidth, we, we want to, I don't believe our employees are using it or our doctors, but our patients, our patients and their families are very eager to use it. So we're segregating the network to try to give them more bandwidth and yet not crowd out the uh, medical devices and the wows that the nurses use. Um, We've fully implemented EPIC uh, in uh, 2012 and 2013, and we finished implementing at Valley Health in 2014. Valley Health is an independent hospital system in the Shenandoah Valley with 11 hospitals and 6,000 employees, about 1,000 affiliated physicians. They are sharing our instance of the EPIC database, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Um, we are monitoring patients in, at home. We expect that to grow dramatically. Uh, and uh, the Internet of Things is a big issue for us. And then the data from that we want to learn to analyze uh, better. We do have two data centers, but they're not mirrored. Uh, we intend to go to mirrored data centers uh, so we can essentially eliminate downtime, at least for our major applications. Right now, if our major data center went down, it would take us three to four hours to bring Epic back up from the other data center. We really want to go to a mirrored uh, architecture. We have a plethora of departmental systems, over 200 
Um, many of them preceded EPIC. Uh, many of them don't meet IT general controls. They're not managed in a secure way. Access is sloppy. Um, upgrades are sloppy. Some of them are on very old versions of the Windows or other operating systems. We have a, pro a process right now to bring everyone who's running any of those systems into the technology division and frankly to turn off as many of them as we can. Um, Connect Virginia is important uh, to UVA and to ANOVA and I'm only going to mention it because it, it could be part of the solution to the grand challenge. Um, Connect Virginia has been hobbled by not having uh, funding from the payers in the state. You heard yesterday from the woman from Johns Hopkins how wonderful the Health Information Exchange in Maryland is. That's the CRISP, C-R-I-S-P, uh, Health Information Exchange. CRISP is an acronym. I don't remember the five words that spell it, but um, they call it CRISP. Uh, we don't have that requirement here in the Commonwealth. Uh, the uh, the Co Connect Virginia is sponsored by state government and by UVA, Inova, and most of the larger hospital systems in the Commonwealth. Payers have not participated. I think that's going to change for the better, uh, and I'll just touch on why. Um, right now, we have public health reporting where providers are sending data electronically to the state for births, deaths, communicable disease, and the like. We're about to turn on bi-directional communication, which will help hospitals check on those records electronically. We are connected to the eHealth Exchange, and we do exchange records with the Social Security Administration and the military and the VA. Use of that is growing um, monthly. The most important service that we're rendering and the one that's generating almost all the value are encounter alerts. Uh, we've piloted this in Northern Virginia with medical groups that are under capitation for the care of populations of patients, and they love it. You heard the woman from Hopkins say how important encounter alerts or ADT alerts are in Maryland. We're actually already integrated with CRISP, and we're sending to CRISP ADT alerts for people from Maryland who get care in Northern Virginia. And CRISP is sending the return information uh, to us uh, we're going to roll out encounter alerts this year, the next 12 months, across the entire state and I think prove the value of this health information exchange. Then this health information exchange could be used for home monitoring, uh, sharing of analytics, and a lot of other functions that uh, would allow us to uh, achieve the, uh, uh, the grand challenge. In terms of EPIC, we have 200 people um, involved in EPIC. I said we take care of one instance of the database is running both revenue cycle and clinicals for 11 hospitals, 400 ambulatory locations. We're adding at ANOVA 12 to 15 locations a month, and Valley's adding two to three a month. I'm sure UVA is growing as well, the, the, but the growth in Northern Virginia is shocking. And, uh, and with that comes an awful lot of work to, to do, the, uh, to do the, uh, the build for all those new specialties and new locations. Um, Inova implemented EPIC, uh, including Revenue Cycle, in 22 months. We implemented EPIC for Valley Health start to finish contract signing to complete implementation in 10 months. The, way, the, the reason we were able to do that in so quickly with Valley is they came into our instance of the database. And it's an example of what we can do together if we share technical architecture. And again, when we get to analytics, we need to think about using those same economies. Um, uh, well, there are about 250 people that run EPIC between both organizations. We have 3 million unique records. We have 25,000 daily users. And um, our managers are beginning to wake up to the extraordinary opportunity to improve operations by modifying workflows uh, and then, and then uh, um, make, uh, implementing those workflows in EPIC. In terms of biomedical engineering, uh, almost all the devices that Biomed takes care of, clinical engineering takes care of, are digital. We, uh, we added 8,000 devices between 2014 and 2015. We're probably going to add another 8 to 10,000 devices before the end of 2016. 
Um, so the, the growth in adding uh, uh, digital devices, including iPads and iPhones and, and uh, all, the, all of the uh, wearable devices, is really quite astonishing. Um, we have around 10,000 of those clinical engineering devices on the network. We, uh, 3,000 of them are capsule devices that take data from physiological monitors and push, them in, push the data into the EMR automatically, a source of data that would, we would do that in part to take advantage of the, of the uh, predictive monitoring algorithms that UVA is developing with, with Randall's guidance. We are beginning to, to, to put video over the network to, to uh, watch patients, to replace sitters with, with monitoring stations. We can't find or employ enough sitters. I'm sure that's a problem everywhere. And uh, we're piloting uh, real-time location services, even though we're going to get much better at that when we, when we upgrade our network. We're piloting real-time location services to to monitor day, uh, hourly rounding uh, for our nurses and to monitor hand washing. We're actually in several nursing units. We put um, sensors on all the soap dispensers and we're calculating the times that uh, nurses and physicians and other clinicians uh, soap in and out. Believe it or not, the nurses like it because the nurse leaders now have some data they can use to really understand um, uh, the frequency of nurse rounding, we're, we're, we're beginning to correlate the frequency of nurse rounding and hand washing with the frequency of infections and patient satisfaction in nursing units, and we're finding the correlation is substantial. It, it, it matters. So uh, over the next year, we're going to put RTLS tags everywhere, and, and we're going to track devices, employees, and patients because we want to follow and study um, their, their flow of patients and families. So when you come into an ANOVA facility in a couple of years, you'll get a, some sort of temporary badge and it'll have a, it'll have a, um, a radio frequency or an infrared tag. We do telemedicine. Uh, we're not nearly uh, as famous as UVA in telemedicine. Dr. Ruban runs telemedicine at, at UVA and does a beautiful job. Uh, but we do about 800 telemedicine sessions a month. Uh, we have uh, Philips uh, uh, EICU for, with 100 beds in our various ICUs, uh, but we're also doing an enormous number of mental health telemedicine sessions uh, between, um, between uh, a central location and all of our various um, uh, emergency rooms. Uh, we, have eight, we have five hospitals, but eight emergency rooms. Uh, we have three standalone uh, emergency rooms. And there are an awful lot of uh, uh, mental health assessments that need to occur at 2 and 3 in the morning. So we're using uh, telemedicine for that. Another source of data for the sort of analytics that uh, we together can develop. Um, analytics, uh, we have 20 people in analytics. We need 200 um, and probably 100 of them data scientists and we can't afford to hire them. Uh, again, Innova pinches pennies uh, in order to have a good bottom line and then have a good bond rating. Um, so we need 100 data scientists and another 100 dead, uh, analysts. Where are we going to get them? Well, you're going to hear in a moment how we want to do it, but it's essentially through partnering. The same, the same idea that uh, John mentioned and the same idea that uh, Rick Shannon mentioned yesterday. Um, we are unusual in that we do a lot of genetic testing. We've done 10,000 whole genome sequences. Uh, we expect to have around 30,000 whole genome sequences in, in 18 months, 24 months. We're also now doing pharmacogenomic testing on every newborn and offering that testing to their parents. Um, the, the whole genome sequences we've done to study premature birth, it's very interesting that Randall's group has developed such exquisite predictive mathematics for premature birth. Uh, Innova has one of the biggest NICUs in the world with 110 beds at Fairfax alone. And then we've got NICUs at Alexandria and, and, uh, and uh, Loudoun hospitals as well. And we want to bring that predictive monitoring that you've developed at UVA to Innova. 
uh, we absolutely should be using it. And I think the architecture is getting uh, uh, right so we could do that. Um, back, to the, back to the genetics. Um, we have, we, we've extracted for all 10,000 people on whom we've done whole genome sequences, we've and they were all neonates uh, at ANOVA. Um, by the way, I probably should have said that. We, we, we were, we're interested in studying uh, premature birth and the causes of it. We've done the whole genome sequences on infants in the NICU, age match controls who were not in the NICU, plus their parents, plus their grandparents. That's the source of all the whole genome sequences. And uh, we're finding that the, uh, it, it's multigenic, but we can predict, it looks like we'll be able to predict premature birth with a C statistic of around 0.8, uh, just based on the genetic data that we've collected from uh, infants, parents, and grandparents. We haven't published that yet, but uh, we're working on it. But we've pulled all the physiological data from EPIC, and we've got peta many petabytes of data stored in the Amazon cloud, and uh, we need to uh, analyze it um, better than we are. The biggest challenge I think we have, frankly, is just the managers uh, of our, we have about 800 managers in the Innova system, and they're just beginning to wake up and understand the power of the analytics that they could bring to improve their operations. Uh, we are rolling out some of the EPIC functions like radar dashboards and universes and registries, and we're having good success with that. I'll tell you, we take our inspiration from UVA's, the Center for Advanced Medical Analytics, and from the Virginia Tech uh, Institute, uh, the, the Virginia Tech uh, Biocomplexity Institute, where they do have around three, 300 data scientists doing uh, substantial work for the federal government, for pharmaceutical firms, and for payers. More on that in a minute. PMO is small. We have seven people. We need 30. But we are standardizing, we're training project management for all managers in ANOVA. That'll take place over the next 12 months. We've already created the curriculum. And every project that's run by anybody will follow several characteristics. We will use SharePoint for all document exchange and documentation of the projects. We'll use CA Clarity for project management and portfolio management. And we'll use ServiceNow to track time. We're going to track time um, of every employee everyone who's working in technology services the way consulting firms do or law firms do so we can begin associating effort with projects. All right, well then that leads me into uh, to the topic that, that'll get, get us then back to the, to, or get us to the grand challenge. Um, this is what was the uh, world headquarters for ExxonMobil, um, 120 acres on the Beltway immediately across the street from Fairfax Hospital, the 1,000-bed hospital in Ova's flagship. Uh, it also is uh, a quarter of a mile from the executive offices of Inova, and uh, those buildings take 20 acres, but there are 117 acres on the property. The FAR measurement, and I've, if, uh, FAR is a measurement of re real estate density. The property right now has a FAR score of 0.4, um, but it's zoned for a FAR score of 4. So we can increase the number of people on that campus tenfold. Right now, these buildings would house around 3,500 people. We could, we could house 35,000 people on this property. And so over the next 20 years, Inova will become a real estate developer and wants to attract the smartest people with the best technology to help us do what we can't afford to do working alone. And this gets me to the grand challenge. Um, let me tell you about these buildings. So building A it will be the Inova Medical Group. There are, by the way, I should have said, there's 1.2 million square feet in these buildings. Uh, and then the amenities building is actually the conference center, the cafeteria, uh, the gym, um, and some other storage. Um, by the way, you don't see any parking garages because parking is entirely underground. But parking for 4,000 cars is already in place. 
In fact, there's a road under the road you see that's as wide as the road you see, and it's tall enough, it's a tunnel, tall enough to handle 18 wheelers. Um, this actual property was developed by Mobile Corporation to be a bunker and to be one that no one knew existed. So they surrounded it with trees, so you really certainly can't see it in the summer, and you can hardly see it in the winter. And they put every, all the utilities and the accesses underground guarded on both sides because they built it in the 70s during the oil crises when people weren't fond of oil companies. Exxon bought, bought Mobil, it became the Exxon headquarters, and then uh, uh, five years ago they decided they wanted to move to Texas, a, a friendlier climate for an oil company. Well, they tried to sell it for three years and they couldn't do it, and we knew we wanted it, but typical of us, we didn't offer. Their, their, the, the, the price they wanted was over $400 million. Uh, by the way, you couldn't build this for a billion today. They wanted $400 million. We just held our ground, uh, waited to see what would happen, and eventually bought it for $180 million. Um, and um, now, what are we going to do with it? Well, Building A is the medical group. Building B is the cancer center. Building C is going to be for genetic labs and wet labs. Uh, we expect an explosion of interest in contract genetics. Uh, as the price of genetics and genetic analysis falls, we think there'll be an opportunity for us to become a low-cost provider of whole genome sequencing and the like. So we're going to see if we can do that. So that building C is the least defined of the buildings. And then D is our technology tower, in which we're going to put some of the folks in my division but then we're going to put all the talented people we can't afford to hire, but we want to attract them to come to work with us to develop algorithms of their own. They can sell commercially algorithms based on data that we provide them. And so in the technology tower, we're going to put the analytics accelerator, which essentially is a, uh, a funding source for young companies. Um, we'll provide a little bit of money, we'll provide space, and we'll let them analyze our data. And if they and we are only interested in companies that are going to analyze data to improve the care of our patients or improve our operations. We're not interested in having companies come that aren't going to do something that's immediately important to our strategic goals. But if a company has, uh, uh, is interested in, in our strategic goals and has bright people who know how to use machine learning and other technologies to analyze data, we're going to give them space. We may give them a little money, and we're certainly going to give them access to our technology. We've also announced a publicly a $120 million venture capital fund. That's the start of what could be a three or $400 million fund, but we want to use the venture capital to attract companies a little bit more mature than those who would go through the accelerator. Companies that would come in that may have one or two clients, they have a product, we want to pilot it, we want to see if it works, and if we like it, um, uh, we'll give them space, we'll give them access to our doctors, nur nurses, and, and data. And if we like what they do, we will negotiate up front an opportunity to buy stock in their company. We figure that's the best way for us to, to um, create a return. We don't want to create a feeding frenzy for lawyers by negotiating intellectual property issues. If, if a company comes to us and creates intellectual property, God bless them. We would like to be a part owner in the company. Technology transfer and commercialization. We do have a faculty. We do have 500 employed positions. We have recruited some very talented people from Duke, uh, from Roswell Park, and others to lead our cancer center and our heart center. And uh, we, are, we expect we'll begin doing more of our own basic research, not nearly to the extent UVA does, but uh, we'll begin spinning off some technologies, we, we, we hope. So that gets me to the grand challenge. The grand challenge, uh, which uh, uh, UVA's talked about, Rick Shannon talked about, John's talked about for MITRE, we've all been talking about it, alluding to it. We're going we're to spend time discussing it when I stop talking. The grand challenge has got to be 
to, to, to figure out how to bring the best and the brightest from around the world to share the data that we in Virginia collect, use the utility of the Connect Virginia network that's already in place, use the, the, the enormous amount of data we have, uh, use the data that are largely in Epic. Uh, now, I'm not excluding data from other vendors, but all the big healthcare systems in the Commonwealth use the same platform. And Epic has a standard information model for its data warehouse. We all have that data warehouse. We can use that data warehouse to collect data in a standard way. And then we can do what I think is the most exciting thing of all, with MITRE and others helping us with the technical architecture, we can drive machine learning across data that we all collect where we don't have to move the data to a central location. They can be kept in the data warehouses that we populate and control, but the analytics can move. Um, C.J. Reiser from MITRE has been, been advocating for that model. It makes a hell of a lot of sense, and it particularly makes sense in the Commonwealth. One of the very interesting, one of the very interesting political uh, realities in the Commonwealth is our big health systems don't really compete with one another. I mean, Carillion, Centera, UVA, Inova, Bon Secours, we don't really compete with one another. Uh, we, we, we can, we can sh I hope we can get over any competitive juices. That, I, I mean, I know Centera does compete in Charleston. I, I understand that with, with Martha Jefferson. But I would hope we could get over those provincial competitive problem, problems and figure out how to share an architecture of, for analytics that would make us all better off, our patients better off, our doctors and nurses more effective. I, and, and, the, and, the, and the legislature of Virginia wants this to happen. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples. The legislature six years ago passed a law that said we had to have one committee to define health IT standards for the Commonwealth and the standards adopted by that committee become law in the Commonwealth. Now, the, honestly, the law is somewhat toothless because if you don't adopt the standards, you don't get, there are no significant penalties. But the Commonwealth did have the, have, have the foresight to say standardization is important. It's important just the way sharing, it's, it's common language. So the Health IT Standards Advisory Committee has promulgated 120 standards. We ought to make sure that we populate our data warehouses with SNOMED and LOINC and those other standards so that we can then drive shared analytics where it's the analytics, the machine learning that move over the network and not our data. Uh, we would be the first state in the nation and the first country in the world to do that. But we can do it. Um, and, and, you know, and Epic is helping because they've created the Star Data Warehouse and they've announced Constellation, which is a mechanism for s sucking data out of the Star Data Warehouses into uh, some sort of shared repository. I think we have even a better idea, which is leave the data in the Star Data Warehouses but move the analytics. Um, the Virginia Biocomplexity Institute, I want to just mention them again because I think that's an extraordinary resource uh, as I learn more about them. Uh, for large-scale analytics. I'll give you one example. I know I'm three minutes over, but Randall ran six minutes over, so, so just not that I pay attention to those things. Um, so when you talk to Chris Barrett, who runs the Virginia Bio... Well, the Virginia Biocomplexity Institute has 300 data scientists, and they have $150 million in revenue every year from external sources. So it's not a small business. They analyze data for the military, for other branches of the federal government, one of, their biggest con one of their biggest customers is Progressive Insurance. What in the world would Progressive Insurance be doing contracting with the Virginia Biocomplexity Institute? Well, the same thing the government is doing. Um, they want to they want to share with uh, with VBI large data sets and help VBI develop machine learning algorithms to, you know, explain what's going to happen based on those data sets. Um, VBI started as the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute, and until about a year ago, that was their name, and they specialized in genetic analysis. Who would have thought in Blacksburg you'd have one of the preeminent places for analyzing genetic data in the world? Well, what, what, they, what they decided, 
about a year ago was to change their name because they said genetic data alone, on average, explains about 20% of the variation in clinical outcomes that you might be interested in studying. Obviously, if you have a Tay-Sachs gene, it's a much bigger uh, proportion than 20%, but overall, it's around 20%. They said habits of living, socioeconomic data, education, um, diet, those data matter much more in explaining what will happen to you in terms of uh, clinical outcomes. They're already pretty good at merging physiological data, sociodemographic data, genetic data um, to build models. And they have created, and this is public, um, they've created an avatar for every human on Earth and they're eager to refine those, and they use those avatars as a mechanism for predicting what populations will do based on changes in insurance policy or government policy or infections or something like that. So um, they're very eager to get more uh, genetic data, more physiological data, and so they're very interested in working with the Inova Center for Personalized Health and would be very interested in working with the University of Virginia or this collaboration of, this large collaboration of analytics that we could all set up together. So, in summary, um, we have an opportunity, and, and, and Innova is happy to be a host and to be a catalyst for this, working with you all, to create learning algorithms using uh, machine learning techniques that have only evolved in the last 10 years to improve identify ways, as Randall's doing for the ICU and NICU, identify ways of, of predicting outcomes before they occur and improving our ability to care for patients with those predictions across the Commonwealth with us sharing an analytical platform. And I think that's probably worthy of discussion after I leave the podium. Thank you.